Okay, thank you everybody for coming today. Um, and thanks especially to Professor Emily Baum uh, for joining us. She's an associate professor of modern Chinese history at UC Irvine. Her first book, which we'll be hearing a little bit about today, is The Invention of Madness, State, Society, and the Insane in Modern China. It was published by University of Chicago Press just last year in 2018. Her research interests center on history of illness, deviance, science, and superstition, both in China and around the world. And she's currently at work on a project investigating fortune telling and occultism in the People's Republic of China and Hong Kong. So maybe we can talk about that towards the end as well. Professor Baum is also active as a public intellectual, sharing her important work and perspective in venues like the Los Angeles Review of Books, the Times Literary Supplement, and the digital magazine Aeon. She's also received uh, numerous awards for uh, her scholarship and for her teaching at UC Irvine. Uh, she received her bachelor's from uh, Georgetown University, her master's from Columbia University, a certificate in language from Johns Hopkins University in Nanjing, um, and her PhD from, uh, from UCSD, from U uh, University of California, San Diego. She was a Hellman Fellow, a Henry Luce Foundation Postdoctoral Fellow, Rockefeller, Fulbright, and Javits Fellowship recipient as well, among numerous other um, recognitions and awards. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to have Professor Baum on campus. Uh, quickly, I uh, also want to thank our co-sponsors, the CSUSB History Department, uh, the Economics Department, the History Club, and File for Theta, thanks to uh, Elvia and Giovanni for being here today, the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the College of Extended Learning and Global Education, the Center for Global Management uh, in the College of Business and Public Administration, File Library here, um, uh, and I also want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Margaret Hill, uh, uh, Peg Hill and her husband Jim uh, for being here today um, and their affiliation with the World Affairs Council of Inland Southern California um, and the wonderful work that they do for our, uh, our students as well. Thanks also to Pamela Crossan in the History Department, uh, Cassandra Walls and Joanna Grant here in the Faculty Center for Excellence, um, Alan Lavore in Strategic Communications, James Trotter, um, in ATI, uh, and thanks also to Robert Whitehead uh, and Kyle Sandoval uh, for coming here from the bookstore. Um, without further ado, I'll get out of the way, and uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Emily Baum. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy, for um, such a generous introduction. I'm really happy to be back at San Bernardino uh, to talk about the topic of asylums and the insane in early 20th century China. Um, so my talk today is going to be sort of like a snippet from my book. Uh, my book is called The Invention of Madness, as Jeremy talked about, and it just came out with University of Chicago Press in November. So what I'm thinking of doing is starting off the talk by speaking a little bit more generally about what I was hoping to achieve with the book project as a whole, uh, and then a bit later in the talk, I'll, I'll speak more specifically about asylums and what asylums look like in early 20th century China. Um, so generally speaking, uh, the invention of madness, as the title suggests, is a history of madness in early 20th century China. Um, and when I say that it's a history of madness, I mean, um, on the one hand, it's a history of how the concept of madness changed over the course of the early 20th century. Um, but on the other hand, and somewhat more concretely, it's also a history of the institutions where the insane were kept. So this is a, a picture of the Beijing Municipal Asylum, which I'll talk about more a little bit later in the talk. Um, it's a history of the different treatments that were used on the insane. Um, it's a history of uh, the changing vocabularies and changing words that were used to describe the insane, where they referred to as mad or where they referred to as mentally ill. Um, and it's also a history of the people who were tasked with caring for or managing the mentally ill, as well as a history of the mentally ill themselves. Um, so the book starts right around the turn of the 20th century, and it goes up until the start of the Second Sino-Japanese War in 1937. Uh, and one of the things that I show is that over the course of this relatively short period of time, um, the meanings that are associated with madness are continuously broadening. Um, so that is to say, uh, both official and popular understandings of what madness is, 
uh, how madness should be defined, what sort of symptoms madness encompasses, what types of people madness affects. Um, all of these things are continuously changing over the course of the early 20th century, and they're changing in such a way as to be continuously and progressively broadening. So if we start in the late Qing dynasty, um, there was a fairly narrow juridical understanding of what it meant to be mad. Um, basically, from a legal perspective, um, local officials were primarily concerned with the criminally insane. Uh, and even more specifically than that, they were concerned with the insane who had homicidal tendencies. So from as early as the 17th and the 18th centuries, um, the Qing dynasty had written into law that mad people needed to be locked up and restrained so as to prevent them from getting out of the house and potentially committing a violent assault like murder. Um, on the other hand, people who may have popularly been perceived as mad, but who weren't necessarily thought about as uh, violent or criminal or necessarily posing a threat to their communities, um, oftentimes local authorities were more or less content to overlook these people and allow them to wander around the community at will. Um, so this is an image from a pictorial from the late Qing dynasty, and it's depicting a madman. We can tell it's a madman because of how erratically he's moving and how he's dressed in these tattered clothes. Um, but there's a caption that accompanies this image, and the caption basically says, local authorities, there was a madman in the streets. Why didn't you do more to intervene? Uh, and the local authorities say, well, you know, this person wasn't posing a danger to the local community, so we didn't feel like we needed to intervene. All right, so from the late Qing, or as, uh, from the late Qing, uh, local authorities were primarily concerned with uh, the criminally insane, and more specifically than that, they were concerned with the insane who had homicidal tendencies. Now, if we fast forward to around the 1930s, we start to see a much broader conception of what it means to be mad. Uh, and this is at the level of legal discourse, it's at the level of medical discourse, uh, and it's even within uh, the popular media as well. Um, by the 1930s, madness wasn't just being talked about as something that was problematic when it was violent or criminal, um, but instead madness had started to encompass all sorts of various conditions and tendencies and neuroses. Um, so things like truancy, and adultery and homosexuality um, to problems like unhappiness and nonconformity uh, or children disobeying their parents. And there was this whole category of something called problem children, or in Chinese it was wenti artong, right? So these problem children who uh, didn't show up to school, who didn't do their homework, who challenged their parents, um, these people were thought of as potentially mentally ill and potentially needing to see uh, a psychological or psychiatric expert. So in my book, I actually talk about this one article. This is an article that was published in the year 1937 in um, a very popular pictorial called Liangyo. Uh, and the headline of the article is, Are You Crazy? Uh, and basically what this article goes on to argue is that 99% of people in this world are potentially suffering from some sort of diagnosable mental illness. So chances are, if you are reading this article, you are potentially mentally ill as well. And in fact, the subheadline says, in response to this question, are you mentally ill, the subheadline says, you know, don't be so quick to say that you're not. After reading this article, uh, you'll think again. Um, so we can see that as we go from roughly around the turn of the 20th century up until 1937, um, the meanings that are associated with madness and the types of people who are potentially construed as being insane are continuously broadening. Um, we're essentially going from a world in which madness is seen as problematic, primarily when it's violent, to a world in which 99% of people are potentially suffering from some sort of diagnosable mental illness. So the big question that guides my research is how and why did this change come about? Right? How is it possible that we could have such a huge series of paradigmatic shifts in the meaning of madness in such a short period of time. Well, um, if anyone in this room is at all familiar with the global history of psychiatry, and I don't actually expect anyone to be familiar with it, but in case anyone is familiar with the global history of psychiatry, you might think that the answer to this question is fairly obvious. 
uh, you might think uh, that the reason we're seeing all of these changes in the definition of madness in the Chinese context is simply because Chinese intellectuals were looking at what was going on in the state of Western psychiatry, and they were simply emulating and appropriating that. Um, and in fact, that was sort of what was going on. I mean, starting in the middle of the 19th century, uh, if we look at American psychiatry and French psychiatry and German and British psychiatry, we're also seeing an expansion uh, in uh, the sense of what types of people could potentially be construed as insane. Right? So in Western psychiatry, homosexuality was also being talked about as a form of mental illness. Um, problem children had also become a global concern. Um, and there was this very popular discour discourse throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries that in tandem with uh, rising rates of industrialization, in tandem with the spread of global capitalism, more and more people uh, were going crazy. More and more people were becoming mentally ill. So when we're asking this question of how and why did this change come about in the Chinese context, it would be very easy to say that Chinese intellectuals, in their quest to become more modern, in their quest to become more scientific, in their quest to look more like the Western world, uh, were simply looking at what was going on within the state of Western psychiatry and imitating that. Um, well, what I'd like to suggest in my talk today, and this is something that you often hear historians saying, uh, is that the answer is actually a little bit more complicated than that. Um, ultimately, what I argue in the book is that this intellectual and political desire for medical modernity was really just an initial step in a much longer process. Um, once Chinese intellectuals started to go abroad and once they started to become familiar with the state of Western psychiatry uh, and once they began to import these psychiatric ideas back to China, uh, these psychiatric ideas begin to take on a life of their own. Um, they were understood in different ways by different people. They were implemented in different ways by different people. Uh, and they were also misunderstood in different ways by different people. So in other words, these new ideas about madness um, weren't just being kind of transplanted from the West and plunked down wholesale in the Chinese context, uh, but they were continuously being invented and reinvented uh, by ordinary people in ways that made sense to them and in ways that were useful to them. And this is where I get the title of my book, The Invention of Madness, from. So for the rest of the talk, I want to give a concrete example of what I mean by this. Uh, and I'm going to do so by focusing on two main chapters in my book. Uh, and in these chapters, I'm looking at a particular institution called the Beijing Municipal Asylum. Um, now, the Beijing Municipal Asylum is a really interesting institution because it was the first public institution to ever be built in China. Um, throughout the vast majority of Chinese history, the insane were not kept within specialized institutions like asylums, uh, but instead they tended to be kept within uh, the family home and they were cared for by their families. Uh, and in fact, um, the belief that the insane were best tended to by their families was even written into law. So as early as 1689, um, the Qing Dynasty promulgates this mandate that says that families were responsible for keeping watch over their insane relatives, uh, again, to ensure that they didn't get out of the house and potentially commit a violent crime like murder. Uh, and in 1732, yet again, uh, the Qing promulgates another mandate that says that families have to lock up their insane relatives and register them with a local official, such that the officials know uh, that they exist in the community. Uh, and essentially what this meant was that from both a legal and a societal perspective, it was generally understood that families were the ones who were responsible. Can I ask a question because mm -hmm. I don't understand Chinese culture at mm -hmm. all? So when you're saying that these things were put out, is this something like uh, legislatures necessarily made a law or is it something like it's posted on every Yeah, so this was a, a law that um, was applicable to the entirety of the, the Qing dynasty. So, I mean, this was in, written in the Qing 
legal code. Uh, it would have been known by local officials. Uh, and essentially, if um, families didn't abide by these legal mandates and lock up their insane relatives, and if their insane relatives happened to get out and commit a crime, uh, then the families would have been held responsible and punished on uh, the mad person's behalf. So these were very widespread. Um, but basically what this meant was that, you know, from both a legal and a social perspective, uh, it was generally understood that families were the ones who were responsible for caring for the insane. Um, and this is an image from a Western uh, missionary hospital in the southern city of Guangzhou called the uh, John Care Refuge for the Insane. Uh, and it's depicting a mentally ill woman who's actually being transported uh, by what, who's presumably her mother. But it's going to show again that um, mentally ill people uh, during uh, the early period, um, prior to uh, the 20th century, uh, were generally kept within the home. So this begins to change in the early 20th century. Um, and it starts to change largely as a result of something called the Boxer Uprising. If you've ever taken a Chinese history class, you've probably heard of the Boxer Uprising. Um, the Boxer Uprising, very briefly, uh, was an anti-foreign anti-Christian uprising that was started by sort of a ragtag group of people who come to uh, collectively be known as the Boxers United in Righteousness. Um, the Boxer Uprising was supported by the Qing Dynasty, um, but it was very quickly suppressed by the Western powers who were residing in northeastern China at the time. Uh, and the Western powers punished the Qing Dynasty for participating in this uprising. Well, in the aftermath of the Boxer Uprising, the Qing Dynasty sort of belatedly comes to this realization uh, that if it is going to survive into the 20th century, uh, and if the dynastic system as a whole is going to survive into the 20th century, that it is going to have to undertake some pretty serious and substantive reforms. So starting right around the year 1901, um, and continuing until the Qing Dynasty was overthrown about 10 years later, um, the Qing starts to lay out a series of sweeping reforms that collectively come to be known as the New Policy, so the Xinjiang. As part of the New Policies, the Qing begins to experiment with what we might refer to as big government for the first time. Um, they establish all sorts of charitable and social welfare organizations, uh, including uh, the police force. So prior to the first decade of the 20th century, there was no such thing as a professional, salaried, uniformed uh, police force in China. This is part of the new policies. Um, in addition to establishing the first police force, they also start to establish all sorts of um, other charitable and social service institutions, things like poor houses, workhouses, orphanages, soup kitchens, hospitals, reformatories for prostitutes, uh, and perhaps most importantly for our purposes, they also establish the first public asylum in all of China, the Beijing Municipal Asylum, which was established in the year 1908. Well, despite the fact that the Qing um, decides to establish this institution in order to signal to the Western powers that it was, in fact, capable of undertaking sustained modernization, um, the Beijing Municipal Asylum ends up looking very little like other asylums that existed in other parts of the world at this point in time. Um, so for one, um, the Beijing Municipal Asylum was run almost entirely by the police force rather than by physicians. Um, and this differed from other Western asylums at the time, because although Western asylums probably did employ um, policemen or guards in order to keep order, um, at least in the early 20th century, most Western psychopathic hospitals were being run by psychiatrists and other physicians. Um, in contrast, the Beijing Municipal Asylum was run almost entirely by the police. Um, the chief of police appointed the manager of the facility, and the manager of the facility didn't have any medical training. He didn't really have any knowledge of mental illness. He was just a career bureaucrat. Um, the police also staffed and funded the asylum. Uh, and perhaps most interestingly, it was the police, rather than physicians, who made all determinations about whether or not a person was mentally ill and whether or not um, a person needed to be institutionalized. 
Um, so I want to show you um, just a brief clip of a video. And this video is, um, was taken in the early 1930s. We can talk more in the Q&A about the provenance of this video, because it's actually quite interesting. Um, but this video is going to show you just how central the role was of the um, Beijing Municipal Police in running this asylum. So we'll watch just a few seconds of this. So we can see that the police were really central in the operation of this institution. Um, the second way that the Beijing Municipal Asylum looked somewhat different from other Western asylums at this point in time um, had to do with the type of medical care that was given. So there was a physician who was employed at the asylum, um, but he played a relatively minor role in comparison to the police. He typically only came to the asylum about four times per week. Um, and the type of medicine that this practitioner doled out really had nothing to do with Western approaches to psychiatry. So in medical records from the asylum, they don't talk about things like schizophrenia or manic depression, uh, but instead everything is really couched in a traditional medical vocabulary. They talk about things like qi stagnation uh, and uh, too much heat, excess heat in the body, and overabundant mucus fire, uh, and they tend to treat uh, mental illness, again, through traditional Chinese medical regimens, including things like herbs and salves and acupuncture and purgatives. All right, so despite the fact that the Qing Dynasty builds this asylum in order to signal to the Western world that it could be modern, that it was capable of undertaking massive systemic change, uh, the Beijing Municipal Asylum itself ends up being very much a Chinese invention. Now, at the beginning of my talk, I had said that you know, throughout the Qing Dynasty, madness was considered problematic mainly when it was violent. Right. When a madman or a madwoman had violent tendencies or if they posed a threat to the safety of the community, um, only then typically would authorities get involved. Um, on the other hand, when a person was maybe only intermittently insane or when they perhaps weren't perceived as dangerous by the broader community, they were generally allowed to go about their business at will and nobody paid much attention to them. Well, once the asylum gets built in 1908, the very existence of the facility starts to affect how ordinary people both perceive what madness is uh, and who madness affects. So more specifically, we start to see a much broader understanding of what it means to be mad and a much broader understanding of the types of people that madness can legitimately affect. Um, by the 19-teens and the 1920s, people are no longer thinking about madness as problematic only when it is violent or dangerous. Instead, um, they start to think about madness when it comes to individuals who we might consider to be merely problematic or mildly disruptive. Um, and so I want to give a few examples to illustrate this shift. Um, and all of these examples come from um, the Beijing Municipal Archives. Um, so one of the things that was really useful about the police managing this asylum is that the police tended to be pretty good record keepers. Um, over a period of about 30 years, they left behind hundreds if not thousands of records pertaining to people who went into and came out of this asylum. Um, so this is a typical example. This is an excerpt of um, a record uh, that the police left from uh, the Beijing Municipal Asylum. Um, and the records were fairly formulaic. They'd typically start off with a report about the situation. So something like, oh, a policeman was making his normal rounds when he happened to come across a madman in the street, and this is what the madman was doing. Um, but from there, what's really interesting about these um, records is that they'll often contain one or more oral testimonies. 
Um, so these oral testimonies would sometimes come from the accusers, people who are accusing someone else of being insane. Um, they might come from the families of the insane, or sometimes these oral testimonies would uh, come from the mentally ill themselves. So this is an example of an oral testimony from a woman uh, named Ms. Wong, who is accusing her neighbor Ms. Gu of being insane. Uh, and we can tell that Ms. Wong is illiterate because she signs her name with an X. And I'll actually be coming back to this specific case uh, a little bit later in the talk. So the police compile all this information. Um, they pass it along to the chief of police. And the chief of police, without having ever met any of these people implicated in person, just on the basis of having read these oral testimonies and on the basis of having read the police report, the chief of police will then make a determination about A, whether or not this person is actually mentally ill, uh, and B, whether this person requires institutionalization within the asylum. Um, so these records are incredibly informative for a number of reasons. Uh, not only do they give us insight into the mechanics of how the police department and the asylum actually worked, um, but they also allow us to peer into the psychology of both the police and local families um, when it comes to the question of who qualifies as insane and how they make this determination. So from here, I'm going to give a couple examples from these case files um, to illustrate what I mean when I say that there is this broadening understanding of what it means to be mentally ill in the early 20th century. Um, the first two examples uh, are, are cases when the police actually comes across a, a supposedly mad person in the street. And then the last two examples are cases where a mentally ill person is brought to the attention of the police by um, their, their families. All right. Um, so the first example involves the case of a man named Zhang Baocheng. In the spring of 1915, a patrolling officer was making his normal rounds when he noticed Zhang, quote, loitering and lingering uh, just inside Gongfu Gate on the eastern side of Beijing. Now, Zhang didn't seem to have any place to be. He didn't seem to know anyone, and he was kind of just hanging around, maybe a little bit suspiciously. Well, compounding the officer's unease with Zhang, was the fact that he was carrying a few strange articles with him. Most significantly, and the police really underscore this in their report, he was carrying with him a copy of the Bible. So the officer talks to Zhang, and he determines that his words are unclear and that he seems to have the demeanor of a crazy person. He takes Zhang into the local police precinct to be interrogated. And in the course of his interrogation, Zhang reveals that he's originally from Yunnan province. And Yunnan is all the way in the southwest of China. So it means he has traveled a very far way away from home. Uh, and that over the course of many months, he had made his way to the capital in search of work. Zhang had finally arrived in Beijing the very day that he was arrested. Uh, but he had nowhere to stay. He had almost no money. And he had no connections in the city either. Furthermore, as he reveals in his testimony, he says he was so exhausted from his travels that maybe he was acting a little bit strangely, but he insists that he wasn't insane. Well, the police aren't sure what to do with him. They still think he's acting maybe a little bit crazy. And so they decide to keep him incarcerated in the asylum uh, while they pass his case along to the chief of police for further review. The chief of police re reviews the case. Uh, and he concludes that Zhang probably isn't crazy, but that he is simply, and I quote, a country bumpkin uh, who doesn't have any work and who will therefore just wander around aimlessly if the police don't intervene. And so on the basis of this determination, the police change Zhang's label in his file from insane to vagrant, from fengren to yomin. Uh, and subsequently, they also transfer Zhang out of the asylum and into the neighboring poorhouse. Um, a second example involves the case of a woman named Mrs. Jian. So in the spring of 1914, just a year before Zhang Baochang was arrested, a patrolling officer was making his normal rounds late at night when he comes across Mrs. Jian, who appears to be wandering aimlessly through the Beijing alleyways. He goes up and talks to her, and he determines that she doesn't know where she is, and she also doesn't know where she's going. So he takes her to the local police precinct to be questioned. In the course of her interrogation, she reveals that she's 49 years old, she's married to a man named Jian Luo Wang, and that she and her husband came to the capital from a village outside of Beijing. And she doesn't know the specific address where she's supposed to be staying. The police ask her if she and her husband came to the capital to beg. Uh, and she either doesn't respond or she sort of avoids the question. She maybe talks her way around it. <clears throat> 
So the police pass this information along to the chief of police, who makes a quick notation in the file saying that Mrs. Chan's words are confused and unclear and that she needed to be sent to the asylum. Well, about two weeks go by when suddenly Mrs. Jen's husband shows up at the police station. He says that he and his wife had come to the Capitol by train, and they had just gotten off the train when they happened to be separated in a huge crowd, which is exactly what Mrs. Jen had said two weeks earlier. He says the only reason he learned where his wife was being held was because he happened to see a missing persons notice that the police had posted. So he promises the police that he will watch over his wife more closely so that this sort of thing doesn't happen in the future. And the police then decide to release Mrs. Jen back to the care of her husband. So what is going on here? Well, the way I see it, there are sort of a few things happening. Um, first, the reason that the police are so suspicious of Zhang Baochang and Mrs. Jen has a lot to do with the fact that they're both displaced, right? They're, they seem lost. Uh, they don't know anyone, uh, they don't have anyone uh, to vouch for them, and because they have come a long way, they're not natives of Beijing, they don't seem to belong to any recognizable uh, social structure, any sort of recognizable community. Um, at the same time, their outsider status makes them very susceptible uh, to the charge that they could potentially stir up trouble in the future. Right? The police specifically ask Mrs. Jen uh, if she had come to the capital to beg, uh, and the police were also really concerned with the fact that Zhang Baochang happened to be carrying a copy of the Bible. Now, it wasn't illegal to carry around the Bible at this point in time. It wasn't illegal to be Christian. But at the same time, the police were highly aware of the potentially destabilizing properties of religion. And if you have ever studied Chinese history, we really only have to think about the Taiping Rebellion to understand how destabilizing religion can be. The Taiping Rebellion was started by a Christian convert, and it ends up killing millions and millions of people and almost ends up bringing the Qing Dynasty to its knees. Um, secondly, in order to understand these cases, we also have to understand that the police were a relatively new organization in China at this point in time. Um, and they're still sort of working out the exact scope of their responsibilities. Um, in Beijing, the police were given a blanket mandate to maintain order and control over the capital city at any cost. Um, and part of that mandate involved preemptively detaining people um, who appeared to be problematic or suspicious, even if those people hadn't necessarily committed a crime or broken the law. So in the case of Zhang Baochang and Mrs. Jen, um, what I suspect is happening is that either the police legitimately couldn't tell the difference between someone who was being uh, potentially problematic and someone who was mentally ill. Or what they're doing is they are using the label of madness as justification to preemptively incarcerate these individuals who could then go on to potentially stir up trouble at a later date. Um, but regardless of what is happening, um, in both cases, what, what occurs essentially is that madness is becoming much more closely linked in the minds of the police, uh, both to displacement and to potentially troublesome behavior. So I want to give two more examples from these case files. And both of these examples involve um, members of the family or members of the neighboring community um, uh, actually actively going out and getting the police in instances when they think that a relative uh, or a neighbor is mentally ill. OK, so the first example centers on a supposedly mad woman named Mrs. Gu. And this is um, from the case file that I showed you earlier. Um, and I should say, again, that this particular case actually doesn't involve the, the immediate family, but it involves a, a neighboring community. These, all these women were living in a courtyard complex in Beijing, so they knew each other very well. Um, Mrs. Gu was a childless widow who lived in this courtyard complex in Beijing with several neighbors, and she made a living by sewing and washing clothes. Well, in the summer of 1916, she gets in a fight with one of her neighbors, Mrs. Wang. Mrs. Wang then calls the police to the courtyard, and when they arrive, she accuses Mrs. Gu of being insane. Well, the police take their oral testimonies in turn, and they determine that the two women have two very different interpretations of what transpired on that day. According to Mrs. Wang, uh, this is the accuser, she says, Mrs. Gu, and I quote, cursed at people day and night, day and night, and on that day she had attacked me relentlessly with a slur of obscenities. Uh, the women had then gotten in a fight when Mrs. Gu pulled out a cleaver and threatened to attack Mrs. Wang with it, although ultimately neither woman was hurt. 
Um, Mrs. Wong then concludes her testimony by telling the police that Mrs. Gu was, quote, certainly insane. Well, when the police ask Mrs. Gu for her recollection of events, she had a very different interpretation of how things had unfolded. According to Mrs. Gu, Mrs. Wong was nothing more than a slut who cheated on her husband. Uh, and because Mrs. Gu routinely voiced her disapproval of Mrs. Wong's behavior, uh, the two women got in fights, and Mrs. Wong tried to play it off by calling Mrs. Gu insane. Well, the police, upon hearing these contradictory stories, were confused about what to do. They didn't know if Mrs. Gu was actually insane or if Mrs. Wong was simply this immoral provocateur. And they actually write this in the case file. They're like, which one do we believe? Well, after some deliberation uh, and after talking to the other courtyard residents, um, and again, also after determining that Mrs. Gu had no immediate family in the vicinity to make sure that she stayed out of trouble and that she stayed out of Mrs. Wong's hair, they finally conclude that there was enough evidence to suggest that Mrs. Gu was, in fact, insane. Uh, and so they take her from her home and they bring her to the asylum. Uh, she was in the asylum for a period of a mere three weeks before being deemed fully cured. And at this point, she was ultimately released to the care of a distant relative who was told to keep her out of trouble. Um, the very last case that I want to talk about is the case of a 52-year-old woman named Mrs. Zhang. So Mrs. Zhang had a son, Zhang Fuzhang, uh, who at some point decides he's going to write a letter to the police imploring them to institutionalize his mother because, according to him, she was insane. The police come to the house to investigate the situation, and again, they take oral testimonies both from Mrs. Zhang and from her son, Zhang Fuzhang. So Zhang Fuzhang gives his testimony first, and this is what he states, and I quote him. He says, my mother curses at people, she cries and laughs irregularly, and she displays world-weary thoughts. I'm afraid she might hurt herself or get into trouble. When the police interview Mrs. Zhang, however, she tells them a completely different version of the story. According to her, she says, her son was only attempting to incarcerate her so that he could gain ownership over a family-owned parcel of land. As she tells the police, and I quote from her, she says, my son accuses me of being insane and plots with his family, uh, to, uh, his wife's family, to have me institutionalized. When my husband was alive, we owned two parcels of land. Ever since my husband died, my son began living apart from me, and he rented out 60 acres of land from the second parcel. I never received any money from it, which made me extremely angry, but I am certainly not insane. The police weigh the evidence, and they ultimately decide that even if the woman was insane, her madness probably wasn't that severe. Uh, and since the family could clearly afford to take care of her on her own, she should remain within the home where she could best be treated uh, by her very filial and loving <laughs> so the examples of Mrs. Gu and Mrs. Wang end differently, right? One is institutionalized and the other remains at home, but they still shed light on a similar phenomenon. Um, what's essentially happening in these two cases is that um, the women's families or the women's neighbors um, are using the label of madness to describe women who are being troublesome, women who are sort of challenging their place in the traditional patriarchal social order. Now, it is impossible to know for certain whether the women's families truly believed that they were insane um, or whether they were just trying to find an, a convenient excuse to get rid of them, to offload them <laughs> to the responsibility of the police. But what we do know is that by invoking this charge of madness, um, by labeling these women mentally ill rather than simply annoying or burdensome, um, not only were their families able to get the attention of the police because the police take these charges very seriously, um, but they were also linking madness more closely with bothersome, problematic, and troublesome people. And I don't think it is a coincidence that both Mrs. Gu and Mrs. Zhang were women. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk more about the gender dynamics of this uh, in the Q&A. All right, so what do these four examples tell us about madness in early 20th century China? Um, well, first of all, as we move from the end of the Qing Dynasty um, to uh, the first few decades of the 20th century, we start to see a shift in terms of who's considered responsible for managing the insane. Um, during the Qing, it was really the family rather than the state that was held primarily responsible for incarcerating the mentally ill. Um, by the time we get to the first decade of the 20th century, however, and, and especially after we see the erection of the Beijing Municipal Asylum in 1908, um, at least part of the, the responsibility for managing the insane had passed 
from the family um, to the municipality and more specifically uh, to the police. Although this is not to say that families were entirely off the hook, as we saw in the example of Mrs. Jung, uh, if they had enough financial means to continue to look after mentally ill people on their own, then it would have been expected that the mentally ill continue to reside at home. Um, but for certain examples, um, a, a lot of this responsibility had passed to the municipality. Um, the other thing that these examples illustrate um, is that over the course of the early 20th century, madness also starts to be imbued with new meanings as well. So as we saw in the cases of Zhang Baochang and Mrs. Chen, um, these individuals were not apprehended by the police because they appeared violent uh, or threatening to their surroundings, or even necessarily because they appeared obviously insane. Um, instead, they were labeled insane and they were taken into police custody um, largely as a result of their outsider status and as a result of their potential ability to be disruptive. So from the perspective of the police, madness starts to be linked to much more banal forms of deviance than just violence. Um, at the same time, and we see this in the examples of Mrs. Gu and Mrs. Zhang, um, the very existence of the municipal asylum enables families to sort of demonstrate a decreased tolerance um, for behaviors that in earlier periods probably would have just been considered normal challenges of everyday life. Um, during the 19-teens and the 1920s, families start to use the language of madness not just when it comes to seriously disruptive or violent or criminal individuals, um, but also to individuals who drain their resources, who test their patients, uh, or who step outside the boundaries of the normal um, uh, patriarchal social order. So in other words, madness by the first few decades of the 20th century had increasingly become associated with people who weren't just criminal, uh, but who were merely inconvenient. So how does this change come about? Um, well, again, as I said at the beginning, this was really a two-step process, right? After the Boxer Uprising, the Qing Dynasty decides it's going to establish all of these social welfare organizations as a way to signal to the Western world that it was capable of modernizing, that it was capable of undertaking uh, sustained systemic change. However, that is really only the start of the story. Um, to return to the argument that I made at the very beginning of this talk, if we look at how these new psychiatric ideas and institutions and discourses were actually implemented and experienced and understood on an everyday level, um, that we'll see that these changing meanings and practices associated with madness weren't just the result of an intellectual or a political desire for modernity, um, but that they were just as importantly the result of ordinary people, be they the police uh, or families or neighbors, just going about their lives, uh, trying to do their jobs, and simply seeking to achieve their own minimal interests. Um, so if I could just switch gears for a few more minutes, um, and then uh, we can move on to the Q&A. I wanted to talk very briefly about the second book project that I'm working on that Jeremy talked a little bit about in the introduction. So the second book project is um, a, switching gears and it's looking at um, divination and fortune telling uh, in uh, post-1949 China, China and Hong Kong. Uh, and this project is a little bit of a departure for me because it's not only looking at a different time period, um, but it's also using a sort of mixed methods approach. The first project was really just based in archival research, but this second project is giving me the opportunity to do some interviews uh, and some ethnographic observation. Um, so I can't obviously run through everything, um, that I have found in the course of my research thus far. Um, but I did just want to look at one snapshot from my research. And this snapshot will hopefully tie back to the first book project on uh, mental illness. Um, so as I was just getting started doing my research on this topic, um, I decided that I would talk to my friends in China about their experiences with fortune telling. Um, and one of the common themes that I found when I was talking to my friends is that people often go to see fortune tellers for issues that we here might consider to be largely psychiatric or psychological. So I have a friend from Henan province who was telling me um, about her local fortune teller and the way she described him is that he basically acts as like a psychological counselor, right? People go to him with their family troubles, with their relationship troubles, if they're just feeling uh, depressed. 
Um, and so one of the things that I realized is that, you know, although there's a lot of media attention about uh, the limited number of psychiatric resources in China, um, one of the things that epidemiologists and public health specialists and journalists don't always take into consideration are these um, unlicensed, more informal healers um, who might not have a degree in psychiatry, but who are still playing a really critical role in sustaining um, mental health, particularly in underserved communities or in rural areas. So I had the opportunity to actually see this in action when I was doing some research in Hong Kong. Um, so I, when I went to Hong Kong, I visited um, a, a Buddhist slash Taoist temple that also served as a hospital. So in the main room of the temple, this was where everyone does the religious rites, but then right next door uh, was a hospital that people could be treated. Um, and in this um, uh, Buddhist slash Taoist temple, a lot of people went there when they were suffering from health problems or from other psychiatric issues, um, and they would tell uh, the main priest what was going on. Um, they would ask for advice or guidance. In this um, image on the left, uh, this person is um, drinking holy water, so this water had been blessed from the, by the priest and it was supposed to help with his health problems. I'm just going to show this quick clip of a video that I took. So this is another one of the head priests and she is communing with the spirits. They're telling her a message that she's then passing along to the woman on her right who's transcribing this message in a series of characters. Um, and then the um, head priest will sort of interpret these characters to the people who have asked a question. Um, and on the basis of the characters that they've written, sometimes they will be able to come up with a prescription, like an herbal remedy prescription uh, for various physical or psychiatric um, disorders. Um, so this is just kind of a quick, quick snapshot of my new book project, but I think I will wrap up there, and I'd be happy to take questions about either of these projects. So thank you again for being such a, a great audience. So. I just wanted to comment that I spent a lot of time since I've read the history of mental illness in the United States, but there really are parallels in that if there have been changing entities yeah. who were the ones who could say whether you were mentally ill or not, and yeah. in the beginning was the family. Mm -hmm. And so that lent it to, again, a lot of women being, <laughs> you know, taken to yeah. the uh, label insane because just they were disruptive rather than right. some other reason. And just to note that uh, even though we would have psychiatrists, that my understanding is that their medical training was extremely limited as well. So we could, you know, you don't want to say, Psychiatrists, I think it's the type of training and right. toolbox that people, psychiatrists, would have today, but really was just the beginnings of someone with the specialty of the mental illness and some limited toolbox in terms of right. what they were able to offer people. Yeah, I, I mean, in the early 20th century and in the, the period that I'm studying in particular, um, psychiatrists were extremely limited in their ability to um, treat the symptoms of mental illness. They had gotten better at describing what caused mental illness, at least from a biological perspective, because they had started doing um, research on the brain and they could sometimes see lesions in the brain, particularly when it comes to things like schizophrenia. Uh, but they were very, very limited um, in uh, the, the types of treatments that they could dole out. Um, they tended to do a lot of things like occupational therapy or work therapy, so they would set the patient on to a particular task and hope that um, in you know, the process of, of working on this task that the patient would be able to sort of focus his or her brain. Uh, but this was before the time of antipsychotic drugs. Um, this was before the time of uh, electroshock therapy. Um, this was even before the time uh, that the lobotomy became clinically available. So you're entirely right that you know, psychiatrists of the early 20th century, they may have considered themselves to be these eminent uh, scientific professionals, but they are very, very limited in terms of what they could achieve therapeutically. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Did the police ever try to incarcerate one of their family members out of convenience? <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> that's a great question. I, I, I don't think I've ever come across a record where it states specifically that the person who was trying to incarcerate their relative was a member of the police. I mean, it probably happened because um, Beijing was had a huge number of policemen. It was actually one of the highest policed 
cities in the entire world at this point in time. So it was likely the case that policemen had actually done this, but I don't have anything in the historical record that specifically states, I am a policeman, and I am, you know, I'm trying to get my relative incarcerated. It probably happened, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has the idea of deviant behavior, especially socially deviant behavior, like protests, that's where I'm going. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking that you got to talk to your friends in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and there was quite a bit of protest going on yes. in Hong Kong. Um, and it, the idea of having police being able to make a decision in, historically uh, about whether or not somebody was nuts or whether or not they were just you know, uh, benign, mm -hmm. and made it a little bit of supervision. Mm -hmm. Okay, are those traditions, do you, did you see evidence, or do they see evidence of that? And I'm thinking about the re-education movement mm -hmm. that is very strong in China. Yeah. So I, I, I'm trying to see where the threads go to keep that right. together and not, not very heavily challenged as far as I can see. Yeah, so if we trace the story up past 1949, after the Chinese Communist Party comes to power, we actually see a lot of continuities in terms of what's going on. Um, the Chinese Communist Party, particularly by the time we get to the period of the Cultural Revolution, which lasted from 1966 to 1976, um, they would often label um, political dissenters or, or people who didn't toe the party line as mentally ill and would institutionalize them on that justification. On the other hand, people who, from a medical perspective, may have legitimately been mentally ill, if these people you know, towed the party line, were supportive of Mao Zedong, were supportive of the Cultural Revolution, they may have been let out of psychiatric facilities. Um, even today, there's still a high degree of political psychiatry in, in contemporary China, where people who are dissenters are sometimes labeled mentally ill and institutionalized against their will. Um, when I was doing my uh, dissertation research um, back in 20, either 2012 or 2013, um, the Chinese Communist Party passed a mental health law, which had been in the works for about two decades up until that point. Um, and one of um, the stipulations in the mental health law was that you know, from this point forward, people are no longer allowed to be institutionalized against their will. Um, and this was supposed to be a way of addressing the problem of political psychiatry. Um, whether or not they have stuck to that is um, another question. Um, I haven't actually done research on the, the more contemporary period, so I don't know what sort of statistics there are in terms of you know, what types of people are being institutionalized, by it, but I suspect that it is still going on, even if we're not necessarily aware of it. Yeah. Did anyone who disagreed with the way how the, the insane were treated, uh, if anyone disagreed with how the insane were treated, were they, since they were in a sense, like a dissenter of uh, policies, would they, have been, uh, would they have been considered insane as well? <laughs> um, well, that, uh, that's another great question. So actually, um, so I was only presenting on, on the first few chapters of my book, but what ends up happening with this municipal asylum is that in the 1930s, um, a new political party called the Guomindang takes over power. And they um, find the municipal asylum highly problematic. Um, they think it's abusive, right? The, the, they think it's quite problematic that it's being run by policemen who have no medical expertise. And so they end up working hand in hand with a local um, uh, teaching hospital called the Peking Union Medical College to convert the Beijing Municipal Asylum into a state-of-the-art psychopathic hospital, and this is like a promotional photograph from that process. Um, and so by the 1930s, it actually was very politically acceptable to condemn how the Chinese were being treated in uh, this earlier period of the 19-teens and 1920s. Um, from our sort of shared idea of, of looking at marginal and marginalized people, mm -hmm. I think um, this idea of, of being a problem is a big one, the W.B. Du Bois idea of being a problem, being pushed to the margins and being made to, to be like an embodied problem, mm -hmm. the, the deviance and that kind of thing. Often when, when we think about that, we also wonder what the normative 
side is and how it's being actively defined, sort of what the normal is, zheng chang. And I often heard in China, my friends would say, you know, right. you're not normal, mm -hmm. you're, you're weird, or for, for you know, teasing each other, <laughs> that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, did, have you found, and, and maybe with the, with the transition, we're talking about Chiang Kai-shek and the, the nationalists and their sort of fascist tendencies, there was this very fascistic, normal, normative hero, you know, right. Superman kind of idea. Are, uh, did you come across definitions of normative behavior, or is it always just in terms of deviance? I mean, that would be great <laughs> if there was like a standard definition of who is considered normal. I mean, unfortunately, I don't think anyone ever made like a list of these are the sorts of behaviors that it means to be like psychologically healthier. Perhaps it exists, but I didn't come across it in the course of my research. But I think we can still infer what normalcy looked like from what the police were trying to achieve during this time. Um, one of the things that they were trying to achieve was um, they wanted these people to labor. They wanted them to engage in work. Um, and so one of the prerequisites for um, uh, allowing people to leave the asylum was that they had to have a family member come and get them, and the family member had to, uh, had to promise the police that this person would be taken back home where they would be engaged in physical labor. Um, and the reason for this is because what I suspect is that not only did the police want these people to be productive, contributing members of society, but if you have a job, then you're sort of stuck in one place. You're not wandering around. You're not traveling from the outskirts of Beijing into the city where you're begging or causing trouble and being unemployed. Right? So labor and employment was something that they were definitely very concerned about. The other thing, um, just to touch on too very briefly, has to do with the place of women. Um, they wanted women to remain within the home. Um, and it's very interesting if we look at statistics about the uh, gender breakup within this asylum. Um, at any given time, it's usually about two-thirds men, one-third women who were uh, institutionalized in the asylum. And part of that gender differential has to do just with the fact that there were more men than women in Beijing at the time. But a lot of it has to do with who the police were allowing into the asylum. Because if you look at um, the breakdown uh, in terms of uh, the families, um, families uh, in sort of equal numbers, it was about 50-50 would bring men and women to the attention of the police and, and characterize them insa as insane. Uh, but the police themselves only tended to institutionalize about one-third women and two-thirds men. Uh, and the reason for this is because they considered the woman uh, to have her rightful place within the familial home. Right? They didn't think that she should be outside of the home, even in a public institution. And so it was often only when uh, the woman didn't have a family to take care of her, uh, or when the family was so poor that they couldn't afford to take care of her, uh, that the police eventually agreed to letting women into the institution. Right? So they were still very uh, concerned with these traditional sort of gender norms about women remaining within a domestic context. Okay. I'll ask uh, okay. <laughs> Since you brought up the woman, though, yeah. um, how did it continue, or do you know how any of these practices you described moved into uh, what is now Taiwan? Oh, you know that—that's a great question, and I did not follow my research to Taiwan. Um, I suspect that a lot of it remained the same. I mean, Taiwan was quite authoritarian for a, a long period, uh, and they did crack down on political dissent. Uh, and so I have a suspicion that sort of a lot of what was going on in mainland China, where they're conflating or using labels of mental illness in order to, to justify institutionalizing political dissenters, probably was happening in Taiwan as well. But I didn't do uh, research in Taiwan specifically. Um, what ends up happening um, in mainland China is uh, you know, once the Second Sino-Japanese War gets underway, actually the Japanese take over this institution and they run it for a period of about eight years. Um, and then after that, the Chinese Communist Party takes it over. And this institution still exists in Beijing today. It's been moved a couple times, but it's still in uh, the northeastern part of Beijing uh, and it is still a psychopathic hospital. So it still exists, but it has gone through multiple waves of, of reinvention, we could say. Yeah. 
Uh, did, were some of the treatments that they gave the, the patients, like trying to give them work, like have them work within the units, uh, the units that, that side of the So during um, the period that I was talking about in, in my talk, no. Um, and mainly because they, they didn't have a lot of space for it. And they weren't necessarily that interested in like rehabilitation. They were more interested in keeping the insane off the streets. Um, in the 1930s, after the asylum was converted into a psychopathic hospital, then occupational therapy became a key component in their um, therapeutic regimen. So they have um, men, for instance, they would uh, churn soybeans uh, and, and make that into soy milk. They had women washing clothes. They had men putting together pill boxes for a local hospital. Um, and the thinking behind this was not only that you know this was therapeutic for the patients, but it would also give them a skill, and so that once they were discharged from the hospital, they could continue to make money using the skill, and they wouldn't be vagrant. They wouldn't end up right back under the custody of the police. Plus, it also generated income from, for the psychopathic hospital as well. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that go with the narrative of being jobbed, having the job or being yeah. a worker kind of stabilizes you? Yeah, I mean, so the, the Guomindang, when they take over this facility, they um, tried to make it seem as though everything they were doing was completely revelatory, it was completely new, and that everything that the old regime, the warlord regime that had preceded them, had done was negative and terrible. Um, but exactly as you pointed out, a lot of what the Guomindang was doing is they are continuing um, previous trends but um, framing them in a new scientific discourse, right? So occupational therapy becomes the most trendy mechanism by which we can rehabilitate the mentally ill. Uh, but it is actually not so different from um, the thinking uh, in the earlier asylum, which is we want these people to labor because then it stabilizes them and it, makes, it, it ensures that they are economically viable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, right during your reach, I, did you find any evidence of that many of the patients being uh, like, being in torture like, like how we see in American incident times? Um, yeah, I mean, they were, they were certainly abused, and um, you, I don't know if you could see the video that I played from over there, but you got a, a, a little bit of a sense of it through the video, how um, the policeman chains up this person and kind of slaps him across the face. Um, so there was certainly abuse going on uh, in these earlier institutions. In the new psychopathic hospital, um, again, I mean, they're still tying these people up, but they're using straight jackets rather than chains. So again, this is supposed to be a way of signaling that they are more modern and more advanced, uh, but they are still restraining them in, in a certain capacity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In that sense, if the patient died because of the abuse or anything, that wasn't much of a concern. That was just like, oh, we have more space. Uh, so this is that's really interesting. Um, so the medical records that were produced from the asylum, um, they don't. There aren't that many medical records. Basically, the only evidence we have from the physician that was on duty occurs when a patient has died. Um, and what they'll say in these medical records is that you know the patient had. He had overabundant bodily heat, and uh, we tried to treat him, but there was nothing that we could do, and he passed away at such and such an hour, and we buried his body in um, the communal graveyard. And my suspicion is the reason that they, they did this was to um, prevent accusations that people died because of the abuses that they received in the institution. Mm -hmm. Would it be then fair to summarize the question about what is normal or what is healthy is you're not bothering anybody and you're not upsetting the social order. Yeah. You're there for mentally well. Yeah. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, right, if you're working, if you're not troubling anyone, if you are not trying to overthrow the government, if you're just doing what you're told, um, then I think that would be a, a, probably a good definition of mental wellness or psychological well-being. Um, you, you talked a little bit about the gender dynamic, and you mm -hmm. said that, that you could go into that in a little bit more detail. Mm -hmm. Were there a few other aspects that you wanted to, to, to draw out, or was that the, 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 this aspect of, of deviance being conflated with a normalcy? Um, 
Um, yeah, so well, one of the things that I did want to talk about was the gender imbalance within the asylum, which I did touch on. Um, I could potentially talk about, um, a little bit later in the 1930s, we start to see new um, types of mental illness being introduced into China. And one of the new types of mental illness that was introduced was a disorder called neurasthenia. Um, neurasthenia was a, a global disease. It, it, it was first identified in the United States in uh, the middle of the 19th century, but it progressively makes its way uh, around the Western world into Japan, into China. Neurasthenia. Um, is sort of like a catch-all disorder for all sorts of, sort of minor psychological issues like malaise or anxiety um, or, or these sorts of things. But it tended to only affect intellectual men. Um, so these are two advertisements um, showing, um, these are advertisements for patent medicines that are supposed to um, target diseases of the brain and the mind like neurasthenia. But as you can see, uh, they're really only depicting intellectual men. Women uh, didn't have to suffer from neurasthenia because they didn't work their minds as much as men. Uh, so in terms of like new uh, types of, uh, <laughs> in types of mental illness, there was also a highly gendered dynamic to that too. Well, what's the age range uh, of the patients? Like, was there a, uh, a minimum age that they were allowed to be? Um, there, um, they didn't say anything about a minimum age. In some of the earlier pictures in my slide show, you, you may have seen children. So women were some, sometimes brought their children into the asylum. Um, most of the people who are institutionalized were in their 20s, uh, 20s and 30s. Um, uh, which is around the time um, that you know women would have been you know, marrying into other people's households, or, or men would have you know had to kind of strike out on their own and 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 find a, a job, uh, especially if they came from a very poor rural community. Um, but it's also the time epidemiologically that a lot of men begin to show the first symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, so 20s and 30s was really the peak age. One more question. Sure. Um, now, I, um, I don't want to put this responsibility on you, but uh -huh. moving, moving forward, a lot of people will look to you to say, is the next, is the next project going to take us into the PRC? And, and Peng mentioned this as well. Mm -hmm. um, because, and, and I think of Dr. Lee's book mm -hmm. uh, about uh, Dr. Lee Jisui, who's Mao's mm -hmm. personal physician, talks very loosely about mental health. I, right. I think, and maybe a little too loosely for, for uh, for, for my taste, when he's talking about Jiang Qing, he's talking about Lin Biao, mm -hmm. very, very, very prominent figures within the Chinese Communist Party, and he, and he speaks quite uh, frankly, and I would say maybe even loosely, about their mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and that, it, it, it seems that there's, although he is not really a very good um, politically correct communist at that point, he, he, he speaks of these figures in a way that, that might overlap with that idea of mm -hmm. deviance from, from some kind of idea. Um, have you looked at the, the post-49? Have you looked at that? And, and I think a lot of the field, mm -hmm. modern China field, will be looking to Emily Baum for the I know. So, <laughs> so the problem with studying this topic in the PRC is that it is politically sensitive. And as anyone who has done research in China knows, it can be very difficult to get access to sources if the Chinese government does not want you to get access to sources. So uh, I mean, one of the reasons that I strategically situated this project in the early 20th century was because it was less politically sensitive and I didn't want to go up into uh, the period of the, the PRC. Um, and I, I think especially now, especially with a lot of the crackdown on ar archival scholarship, um, and archives being closed to researchers, um, different files no longer being accessible to researchers, I think it would be very, very difficult to research this topic post-49. So maybe I'll leave that to another researcher, or maybe I'll leave that for uh, you know, a, a couple of years from now. Hopefully the situation will have opened up. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Baum. Thank you for having me.